Good. 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 Wednesday evening. Wednesday. 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 Wednesday.
And Tan Por Lee, who was a disciple of Ajahn Mun, um, basically uh, had, by all accounts, really amazing practice and went to India uh, at one point and saw the yogis there doing these really fascinating meditations with the breath. And he realized that there's a lot more that you could do with it than he'd seen traditionally taught. And then at one point ill uh, and kind of, I think dying in the forest in Thailand at a later date, he decided to kind of marshal those resources and develop these really whole body breath techniques um, that can be found. They're called method one and method two in a book called keeping the breath in mind by uh, All right. And can you hear me? Sorry. Yep. Okay. You're back. Sorry. Method one and method two. Yeah, method one and method two. And um, basically those just involved either drawing breath energy down through the body, which uh, he thought of breath energy as the chi or pana, and or putting awareness at different points, which he called the stations of consciousness, but which roughly the chakras. Um, and recent scholarship by Ajahn Jeff, Bhante Nalio, and Ajahn Jayasaro has really pointed to the idea that this is in keeping with how the Buddha could have been teaching uh, breath meditation. Um, so yeah, basically the idea being that one could interpret Sabakaya as either one point or um, rather just this awareness of the whole body, breath being the energy within that body. Um, Ajahn, did I freeze at all, or can you hear me? Um, no, you're just a, a little bit glitchy. So okay, but I'm hearing most of you. Yeah. Okay, and, and um, so I'll just say that Ten Por Lee really pointed out that practitioners can either be those who think very little, in which like who don't have a strong proclivity for lots of thought, in which case placing awareness on one point can work quite well. And I think that it did work well for many kind of rural farmers of the pre-modern era because they didn't have the same proclivity towards thinking a lot. But then Ten Por Lee said that there's another class of people who think a lot. And for them, it's really useful to use this more broad interpretation of the breath because it lets you work with the breathing or with the thinking mind and conceive of the breath meditation as a very robust exercise. Um, and that's the one that really worked for me is uh, I have a very, I think a lot. And so I think being given permission and a framework for exploring the body with the breath was really helpful. Um, so there's more to say, but before that, um, I just talked for a while. So maybe I could pass it back to you for a bit, Ajahn, and ask about your, your kind of journey with breath meditation and how you conceive of these two paradigms. Yeah, I mean, similar to you, um, you know, introduced to modern interpretations about the same time I was introduced to the Pali Canon. I mean, I came across the Pali Canon through the Satipatthana Sutta on a 10-day Goenka Vipassana retreat or later on after that. Um, and then it wasn't too much longer that I came across Ajahn uh, Tanisaro's translations from different Thai Ajahns. So I was practicing method two, this very full body breathing uh, from not long after I um, started experimenting a bit more um, uh, outside of the pure Goenka technique. Um, but I, I think you bring up some interesting things about the history, and I'll, I'll go back into a little bit more of my experience. Um, but yeah, one <laughs> doctrinally significant um, concept which you're pointing to is this ekagata which is gata gone to eka one, that which is gone to oneness. And early English translators translated that as one pointedness, which seems fair enough. And that is how um, uh, Buddha Gosa and many early commentators were, were translating it. Um, but yeah, Ajampasano and more modern translators take it as unification. So gone to oneness in the sense of um, unifying, not in the sense of just a tiny little, um, yeah, what is it? Like, what is the point? And for me, um, so, and this isn't just, you know, an, some esoteric point of Buddhist history. I mean, this is how um, the Pa'ak, like living tradition of, there are some serious and impressive meditators in the Pa'ak tradition, but that really is the starting point, is paying attention to a tiny point. And uh, as I understand it, it's like 
right, it's kind of at this junction between the nostrum, right beneath the, the nostril and the, this little indent there. Um, but, you know, the question comes up, what is the point? Like, how small is the point? And if the point, is it a quark? And if it's not a quark, then why can't it be the whole body? Mm. If, I mean, if it's the size of a molecule, why not scale up to being the whole body? And for me, similar to you, Ajahn Nisibo, I mean, um, I just find that having a bigger field of play, Ajahn Mahabua talks about uh, when you're doing body awareness, and he includes uh, breath meditation in this, as does the Buddha. So you can just go on teo, you can go on vacation just around the body. And if you're really trying to give your life to uh, meditation, give your life to the Buddhist path, um, that's a lot of hours in the day. I mean, if you renounce this, renounce that, you're clearing up your your daily schedule. And um, yeah, right now I'm on a, uh, doing a, a week-long retreat. Ajahn Nispo, you're in the middle of a three-month retreat. And yeah, f um, if for people who are fortunate enough to have the time, it can become a lot of time. And just drilling down into one point, um, it really does take a lot of skill, which I'm somewhat doubtful as to, um, you know, just taking a random person off the street and their ability to stay with, you know, uh, a point's worth of um, breath for uh, eight, nine, 10, 16, 18, 20 hours a day. So, yeah. And, um, oh, sorry, Ajahn, I interrupted you. Please. So I'm curious how you've, um, I mean, first, I, I think I might take issue with the word skill there because I don't think it's necessarily a matter of skill versus just your natural inclination. Uh, like, I don't think if someone can't stay with that one point that it means they're maybe less skilled. And I, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not. Um, so much as maybe their meditation approach needs to be different. Um, but could you speak about how you've, you know, how do you make breath meditation work for you right now? You are in retreat. I know you spent a full year at a Pa'ak monastery. And so you've gone that road about as far as when, um, you know, in terms of time wise. And so, yeah, how have you made it work, breath meditation? Yeah, no, it's a good point about skill. And um, I just, use that word um, because I, I think some people do have been, if someone naturally takes to the breath mm -hmm. at one point like that, it to me suggests a high amount of skill and practice, perhaps in past lives, or for, mm -hmm. for some reason they've got an affinity with that end. But I agree with you that um, to say that everyone who can't just stay at one point is unskilled, um, I mean, they're unskilled at that one point, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily unskilled at breath meditation. I mean, Ajahn Jeff, as we've mentioned, Ajahn Tanisaro, Ajahn Suchito, Ajahn Jayasar are very skilled at breath meditation. And um, they don't talk about just that one point. Um, for myself, um, yeah, I did spend <laughs> saying that I, I went about as far as one could go uh, down that system. I'd say I went about as far as I could go uh, oh. at that time in that system, it just became untenable to stay. I mean, just drilling into the breath for me. Um, yeah, doing it for eight plus hours a day, every single day, every single day, um, mm. except for you know, once every two weeks, you take a uh, you know an hour or two break for the Padi Mocha. Um, and it just, it became hang, Thai word for dry. My practice became dry, my heart became dry. And um, so yeah, allowing, uh, a broader field. It's like um, allows for play. And this is something which you see in Ajahn Jeff's writings. I mean, basically, uh, if you go and stay at Wat Metta, you'll see he's constantly experimenting with the breath, as was yes. Ajahn Lee. He'll come up with a new method, it seems like, every day. And it's like, for me, it's comparable to like Monet painting haystacks. Hmm. It's like you're approaching it at a different, uh, different angle, you know, different time of day, and it really does um, allow for a need for novelty. I think when you were talking about people who like to think, uh, I, I, for me, I prefer this concept of a need for novelty. I've got, I just have more. And, you know, it's, it's not, you know, set in stone for my whole life that I always need novelty. But I think this principle of keeping things as simple as possible, but no simpler, uh, as novel as 
uh, only as novel as, as needs to be, but not less novel uh, mm. or more novel. So um, yeah, practiced in many ways. Um, I've combined it with perception of light, the aloka sanya, combined it with the perception of the nada sound, this kind of high-pitched frequency, combined it with, um, looked at it in different parts of the body, in the lungs, for me, the broader, the bigger the area, the better. So a plane, a two-dimensional plane, just looking at the breath right here is better for me than a point. And even better than a plane is a three-dimensional, the whole lungs or even the whole body. So those are just a smattering of different ways that I look at the breath. Um, not going down any one of those uh, too much, but but one can. And that's the kind of beautiful thing is this, like, you know, Monet, any one of his haystacks can just be a total and is a total work of art. Um, so yeah, you can look at the breath in any of these spots with any of these uh, supports and, and really have it be a beautiful, sustainable experience. Um, yeah, do you have any thoughts that come up from that that's kind of just riffing off of each other, which is, I think, a good good metaphor for the what one does with the breath as one's developing skill, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love the analogy of Monet's haystacks and uh, it reminds me, you know, some of the ways I've seen you experiment with it. I think you taught the, the guided meditation called the heavenly jellyfish, which is not a Monet painting, but I would love to see it as one. Um, but the sense of kind of imagining the whole body expanding and contracting in three dimensions. Um, I do think you know, what you pointed to with the distinction between that one point and why can't it just be the whole point? You know, the a one point can be one point on the floor or it can be the whole floor. And for me, that's really where this um, debate about sabakaya, whole body being one point versus the whole body awareness uh, breaks down is I tend to find in, in my own practice that both are relevant. Um, usually I do have to move through the body um, and initially gaining sensitivity to that whole body awareness. And I find that uh, Qigong and cold showers are really, really helpful, skillful means for clarifying that flow of breath energy. Most of us don't have a strong picture of it um, or feel for it initially. And um, once I've sort of become more acquainted with that, then uh, I do find awareness will spiral into one point and it'll rest there for a time and then it'll expand out again and in again, um, out again and in again until they kind of merge like fusion. Um, and and I, I really appreciate that freedom to play with that. Um, in terms of thinking of the whole body, I think the you know, in the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing, the step five is becoming sensitive to pity or rapture. And etymology, um, that's related to the word for drink or like refreshment. And I find that translation so helpful because it really is for me with the experience of um, of chi uh, and becoming sensitive to that kind of flow of, of chi. And, uh, and that image of water is, is everywhere in the analogies for the jhanas, which I don't think have to, you don't have to have achieve jhana to be talking about the breath and the experience of breath meditation with those analogies, but they're just filled with water. The Buddha talks about the bath man's apprentice needing water into the, the ball of bath powder. He talks about a cool mountain. Fluid, fluid metaphors. Um, and the chi, I mean, just the image of a Tai Chi master. We had a, a Tai Chi retreat here about five months ago. And um, uh, yeah, the teacher there was just going on about uh, this movie called My Octopus Teacher and was just saying basically, that he, you know, as a chi, you know, he's been practicing Tai Chi, Qi Gong for, um, you know, 60 years and just takes this, uh, you know, this 
um, aquatic being, which has somewhat inspired me to have this naming of the breath of the heavenly jellyfish breath. Um, but it's, it's a being which is just effortlessly attuned and that when there's movement one place, there's another movement in a different place. And, um, you know, as I was saying for myself, you know, seeing, watching the breath in larger and larger um, canvases or even 3D, you know, watching, you know, the whole um, in breath and out breath and how, I mean, it's not just imagination. I mean, anytime you take an out breath, if you had, or anytime you take an in breath, you are getting taller. You know, if, if we had instruments that were sensitive enough, you know, you could see in breath up a little bit. You know, we're not even talking millimeters. Uh, we might be talking millimeters, but um, um, it's not much. So you can watch it like that. As you say, you can watch it uh, deep down in, and it, it's fascinating that it's got this, um, and we've talked about this before, but this scale invariance. You can watch the breath as big as possible. And honestly, for me, um, how I like, if I can, uh, watch the breath the best is from a panoramic awareness and the breath is just inside of that. So it stems from this insight that people think that, oh, the mind is inside the body. But actually when you, you look, the body is inside the mind. Hmm. You think that the the mind is inside the head, but actually the head is inside the mind. You can know bigger than the head. And similarly, um, the breath is inside of the mind. And this is just a, a sphere of open awareness. And you can just watch, yeah, this this pulsating. And for me, the um, we haven't yet talked about mantras or yoking the breath to audio, uh, uh, things which we're either consciously listening to like the, the nada sound, the sound of silence, or intentionally using a mantra like Budo or Guan Yin. Um, but for me, one which is really helpful to tune me into this bigger breath is expanding on the in-breath and disbanding on mm. the out And that captures this, yeah, watch the whole breath energy in the whole body with this expanding and disbanding. So do you use much? Um, audio, either creation of mantra or um, listening to the not a sound, or feel free to take the conversation in a different direction as well. No, thank you. I, I quickly wanted to dovetail on one of the things you uh, mentioned, which I find that mantra, uh, what was it, something and then disbanding? Expanding. Expanding and disbanding. And, disbanding. and the movement towards uh, awareness itself and sort of foregrounding that and having that hold the breath within it. I just find there's some practitioners like I, I would call long poor tomato among them who that recollection of awareness being primary um, seems very powerful. And one thing I've been struck with is using the elements in breath meditation is really helpful. Like you know, when you're following breath energy, say, it's it's obviously wind energy um, or the wind element um, moved. But I do find if the body's feeling really heavy, then bringing to mind water can just loosen it up. Um, or if it's feeling kind of ungrounded, just saying the word earth, earth, or grounding yourself can be very helpful. But I, I also find it's meaningful that the Buddha sometimes gave a list of six elements and he added in space and consciousness. And I do find there's, you know, even for me who, um, you know, usually I'm quite content to be with, well, I find there's really a time where invoking that element of consciousness and allowing the mind to expand out and foregrounding that uh, is really relevant. And that, that is echoed or, um, it's resonant with the image that Buddha gives of fourth jhana, which I'm not saying this has to align with, but the image, um, the first three images he gives for the first three jhanas are very, you know, uh, it's the water, it's something permeated. But the fourth uh, analogy for the fourth jhana is a person draped in a white cloth. And I remember talking to Longpore Pasano about that. And he said, that's because when the mind gets refined, it 
uh, it kind of separates a bit from the body. And I think your recollection is very beautiful in that you don't have to wait until one of those refined states to inhabit for a time the white cloth. Sometimes that distance and that sort of wide scope is uh, is actually really um, releasing. And and I find for me, I, I use that paradigm often of curry and rice. And you know, your rice is your breath, but then usually I find having a curry in the mix, like a, a secondary object, which could be the nada sound or um, this full body conception of uh, awareness um, or the perception of light is really useful and going back and forth between the two. And the secondary objects I find usually it's all some note of awareness. Um, like lucid awareness has the quality of luminosity. It has the quality of expansiveness. It has the quality of meta. It has the quality of, of the nada sound, at least in my my feeling of it, or at least it's resonant with it. So, so for me, somehow there's this back and forth that's really the the breath and the body in the four elements, and then this fifth and sixth element of conscious and space. And I think your root in can be either. Um, what are your thoughts, Ajahn? And and do you have any? I know right now you're in a Guanyin retreat. So, do you find you know Guanyin has these in notes of meta and of awareness itself do you find you use it in a similar way or what are your thoughts i mean i definitely do i like mantras they bring me back in the guanyin mantra guanyin pusa or guanyin budo guanyin budo um just can bring one back to um one's you know object of meditation and for me the guanyin also has resident resonance with um, the spacious awareness that you're talking about this, another term, which you find in the canon, which is not talked about nearly enough is this, uh, vinyana casina. And it's not like a casina, like the, the circles that you mentioned earlier, but it's casina literally means totality. So the totality of awareness and not claiming to, you know, know what's going on on Saturn, but just a more global, um, awareness that seems, you know, like it can encompass more than just, uh, you know, are delineated by the limits of our skin. Um, mm. But I think, you yeah, know, I appreciate um, your perspectives. And um, just one thing which I appreciate in general about our discussions about this is it's not at all contentious. Like, <laughs> I don't really understand the jhana wars uh, because I don't see why it needs to be a war. You know, mm. people can have different opinions and um, different things work for different people. And the Buddha himself, you know, he could have, go back everybody, read the Anapanasati Sutta, uh, the most detailed description on the breath. And it's very, it's an outline. It's an outline. The Buddha could have been much more specific. He said, parimukang uh, upatapetva, having established mindfulness, parimukha, pari is like a round, mukha is either the face or the mouth. So people interpret that and get really, you know, have very strong views about this. No, it's only the mouth, the rest of the face. That doesn't make any sense. You couldn't breathe in, they would say. But um, yeah, some people um, will flourish uh, when they give their meditation more space to be curious and more space for, for awe. And I think that's um, a really precious thing. And again, if for myself, I do want my practice, my meditation, my breath meditation to be sustainable. I want this to go with me for the rest of this life. And if I don't achieve my goal in this life, going on and um, yeah, being willing to experiment with other things when you know one method isn't working is really helpful. Sometimes you hear a, a simile of, you know, if you want to get to gold or if you want to, you know, find water in the ground, you're not going to, you know, you'll hurt yourself if you or you're you're not gonna. You're never gonna get to gold if you dig here and dig there. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, all of these experiments with breath, we're digging in the same region, and mm -hmm. um, or, yeah. or like chasing a chasing a groundhog or something. So it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay to dig here and there a little. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Same, same, same ballpark. Mm -hmm. So. 
Thank you, Arjun. Yeah, I um, no, I, I I do think the um, this has been such a block for a lot of people, and I'm so grateful for the teachers that have, because I do think that one pointed awareness works for people, and I think it's useful to have. And teachers like Ajahn um, Sona and others do emphasize that approach. But for those of us who need something else, um, you know, having resources, and just to name a few, uh, dhammatalks.org with Ajahn Jeff, uh, his talks go into all these ways of playing with the breath. Um, his books, Keeping the Breath in Mind and With Each and Every Breath, uh, which one of which is a translation of Tanpur Lee, those are free online. There's uh, Ajahn Suchitta's Breathing Like a Buddha, which is a free PDF online, and it's brilliant. And those all give these really robust ways of approaching breath. Um, and, you know, you have Shaila Catherine, Wisdom Wide and Deep, Ajahn Brahm, um, just so many ways of approaching it. And I think it's significant that the Buddha gave the Anapanasati Sutta um, during a rains retreat, I think, where there was a bunch of practitioners working with different techniques. Um, they were all practicing. And the fact that he gave it in that context because its ability to really effectively bring the seven enlightenment factors to culmination, which is one of the things he says it does, along with the four foundations of mindfulness and true knowledge and deliverance, really for me indicates that it's it's just useful to pair with whatever your practice is. And um, yeah, it's just a helpful, the scaffolding in those 16 steps of the Anapanasati Sutta, it's just such a brilliant map. And if you're going to memorize one sutta apart from maybe the turning of the wheel of Dhamma, the first discourse, this is the one I think, because so often I'll find myself lost in meditation and then realize I, I actually am, I'm, you know, between this and that step in the Anapanasati sutta. So same, same. Just one comment before we go to questions so people can put questions in the chat. Um, Ajahn, you mentioned the simile between rice and curry and, um, Another similar concept, which Bhante Analia talks about, is foregrounding and then backgrounding. Yeah. So like with, he talks about this in his book about the Anapanasati Sutta, is you might, so through all 16 steps, you've got the breath somewhere on the stage, yeah? But with this breathing in, experiencing the whole body, you might be foregrounding your experience of the whole body. And the breath is there in the background. So I'm not sure if that's, like when you said the rice and the curry, you said they might be different bites, but um, could they be the same bite? Like, can you do not a sound with the breath or do you have to go not a sound, okay, full attention and then the breath in the next moment or? No, I, I, think, I think they definitely can be the same bite. I think when people hear about keeping two things in mind, initially it can be quite hard and my own practice it tends to work a bit better to allow awareness to go to one of the objects it wants to but keeping just sort of trusting or, or checking in with that secondary even if it's just five or ten percent and then trusting that it'll switch when the mind's ready and and, and noticing when the mind's grown tired of one one bite but then when the mind gets calmer it becomes much more permeable, I find, and and the two things really can merge into one bite more. Um, Ajahn Kovilo and I have this uh, practice where when we're in group situations, we establish one of our, our number, him or me, to be the foremost friar. So one of us will be kind of foregrounded and and leading the discussion and the other will be backgrounded. And, and even if I'm the foremost friar, like I'm very aware of Ajahn Kovilo right behind me me uh hopefully smiling or not looking and, uh, <laughs> and you know and then there's this very natural shift at times so yeah me um I, I mean yes i think that they can be one bite but i do find initially it can be hard to try to make it one bite interesting i have the exact opposite experience but um yeah we can maybe another time so great um thank you ajan that was a fun yeah, discussion thank let's uh thank you. I'll ask the first question for you. How about that? Right. Sleepiness is the big hindrance coming during my meditation now. How do I overcome it? Fantastic question. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, one is just to see, are you actually getting enough sleep? I mean, I would recommend for everybody the book, Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker. It really changed my life and it changed a lot of other monks' life. Um, not in the sense of you know, excusing just being lazy monks, but actually there's a lot of sleep deprivation in some of these monasteries and you see it in terms of accidents happening around the place um, or yeah, just grumpy moods. Um, so yeah, are you getting enough sleep for you? Uh, but if you are, and it's just a mental wanting to turn off, the Pali word is arati, arati. Rati is to delight in something or to enjoy something and arati is to dislike something. So I know for me, when I'm feeling sleepy, it's like certain, I'm feeling certain sensations in the body and then I don't want to experience them. For, particularly with sleep, I start feeling this sleep pressure around you know, the orbicular oralis, these, muscular, these muscles around the eyes, and they just start you know, getting you know, more and more tense. Um, so for me, not allowing, so allowing that, allowing that, um, but seeing if you can pay attention to, uh, you are experiencing the rest of your body as well when you're tired. Consciousness knows your back. It knows your feet, it knows your hands, and it knows your elbows um, anytime that you're sleepy. And actually just um, giving your, paying attention to that can bring enough curiosity to actually lead you through the, the hump of, of torpor. So do you have any thoughts on that, Ajahn? Uh, I think those, that's great. Yeah. All right, let me get you one of these. Um, okay, we have people mentioning. A lot of octopus comments. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful speech. I, all right. Here, let's try this. Okay, I feel like our breath even stimulates all our organs from its expansion and contraction. Um, do you want to comment on that? Not, you know, it's a, it's a reflection. Um, I, I agree. I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Go for the next one. Um, Namaste, Bhatte. When you were with your doctor father, and this is for me, I'll skip that one. Please, no, 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 take it, Ajahn, please. Your doctor father, when you, uh, were you interested in psychiatry or psychology? Does that help you to understand Buddhism also? Yeah, i definitely very interested in psychology. I mean, uh, I have a copy of the DSM-5 in my, in my room. And uh, I think a lot of monks, especially Western monks who, intentionally chose to uh, ordain, were not born in Buddhist families, um, they have an interest in psychology. It dovetails almost perfectly for me. Um, not so much psych uh, psychiatry. I never thought about going to medical school really, or yeah, becoming a doctor, but. Achan, yourself? Nope. No, okay. <laughs> well, I looked into psychotherapy for, that would have been maybe my career path before becoming a monk, but okay. yeah. But, but I found, I mean, one thing I think worth mentioning is um, I find there's a limit to Western paradigms in psychology that I've seen generally. Um, and, and these are broad strokes, but I've talked to community members who are counselors and psychologists and, and feel the same. And that's that there's this element of the approach, I think, can be to unwind to look into the stories that are dominating us. And what I find so powerful about, um, and I think there's a place for that and leaning into it, but what I think Buddhism provides is a place to rest beyond the stories. Like it's hard to get beyond story when there's no transcendent place for to put your feet when you've let go, go of the stories. And I think Buddhism provides that like uh, Panya, the third aspect of the noble threefold division of the noble eightfold path, you know, Sila, Samadhi, Panya, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Like Panya is about seeing through those narratives and understanding how our conditioning creates us. But then Sila and Samadhi are about kind of brightening the chitta and really creating this radiant place to, to rest the heart once you let go of those other stories. And I just find it accelerates 
cases. So I just think that there's, there's a limit to how far Western psychology ability to really cultivate positive emotional well-being at the same level that a Buddhist practice imbued with giving morality, regular concentration and community can. So, and ritual. Great point. Ajahn, I've got a good question for you. Um, we didn't touch on. So Ajahn, do you think breath meditation makes you feel that the air is coming out uh, from each pore in your body, like a fan that is turned on your entire face? <laughs> I know some people have that experience. I find it's very skillful means to imagine the breath as coming in through various parts of the body. Um, so often if people want to try, say, imagining the breath as a nourishing luminous mist or white mist coming in and out through um, the, the lower parts of the body, um, like breathing in through the the kind of diaphragm, imagining inhaling through the diaphragm and then allowing the breath energy to kind of move up and down the meridians at the same time. And I think that's useful because most of us realize we're stuck up in the upper half of our body and that helps balance. But I think we don't often realize that we're also stuck in the front half of our body and Imagining breathing that same mist in through your shoulder blades or your kidneys uh, can really balance the breath body, I think. And I know Ajahn Yanadamo, Longpur Yanadamo spoke about how for him, a key breakthrough in breath meditation was imagining breathing in through his shoulder blades. Um, so yeah, just uh, I think if you're deeply concentrated, perhaps there's a more genuine experience of breathing in through the pores of the body. but for me, it's more a skillful means uh, of imagining you on that. Um, nope, similar experiences to you. Yeah. I think we have time for one more and uh, oh gosh, there's a big one, but uh, all right, let's, let's try it. Oh, wait, it starts up here. There was a murder case in Australia over past past two weeks, and usually I do not get involved in news. However, I did every day, and when it was solved, I noticed the body, body incredibly tense and emotions of intense fear and such sadness. I've been practicing daily. However, I am unsure as to why I clung to the story and the suffering that was obviously going to occur, how to avoid clinging. Wow, a fantastic question, because a lot of us just yeah, we cling to things and don't even know why. It's a, it's a obsession, um, it's a compulsion. It, it can be an addiction. Um, yeah, you just get some, there's some level of satisfaction that you get either, um, that we all, most people get. Um, you know, that's why people watch news is there's some level of satisfaction. You're staying up with things or you're just, it's painful to be alone with one's, just one's breath and one's body. Um, so there's some gratification there, but yeah, no, there's a lot. We take on so much tension from our environments. Most of us, maybe even all of us. Um, so yeah, being aware of it. And I think this breathing in, experiencing the whole body as we've been talking about mm -hmm. is really good for that because you can't predict where you're going to start getting tense from your environment. Um, you know, it might be the shoulders, it might be the face. Those are common, but it might be your hands. It might be your upper legs. It can be all over. So the more you know, you're able to tune into the the breath and even just the feelings in the body, the musculature, the the tensions in the body, uh, the more you're able to address things at that uh, biological, muscular level. So yeah, I hope you're able to tune out of that news. So thank you, Ajahn. And I do think we. We have other questions and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but if people want to jump onto Zoom, we can speak about them there. Um, the link I've just posted into the chat, uh, feel free to click on it. And then in, uh, if you don't see it or can't find it, uh, feel free to go to clearmountainmonastery.org, navigate down to the Wednesday evening live stream event listing, and there's a Zoom link there. 
Um, so just, it's always wonderful to sort of have these discussions with you, Ajahn. I'm so grateful and uh, thank you. Thank you, friend, venerable. Yeah, I agree with all that too, so. Okay, uh, bye community. We'll see you in a few seconds.